Hi everyone, it's uh, Dr. Goyle here from Peak Human Labs and today we have a new episode and I have my assistant here today. Hi, I'm Omiya Goyle and today we're going to have a, a conversation about the neurobiology of sleep. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, the reason we're doing this is because there's a new medication on the market called Lemborexent, which we've written out here, uh, trade name De Vigo. That's pretty exciting, it, uh, and we thought we'd give you some of the background on sleep so you can understand how this medication works and uh, whether it might be for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's get started. Yeah, so uh, first I think let's just start with uh, why is sleep important? Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, why? The fact that it's present in, in uh, basically all animals in, in the animal kingdom, you know, everything from all mammals, birds, some reptiles, and maybe even present in insects, um, tells us that it must serve a very important function that we don't exactly know. It may have some uh, benefit for, uh, you know, uh, restoration of the, of the brain, of the nervous system. It may have some detoxifying uh, mechanism, but uh, that's kind of a mystery. Yeah. But because otherwise it would have been taken out, ev taken out evolutionary. Like yeah, exactly. Like an animal would have died if there wasn't, you know, they would have been preyed upon the risk of basically falling asleep and being preyed mm -hmm. upon. It's much too great for it to not be important. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let's, let's let's just keep first, going on. Yeah, let's go in. Uh, so let's see what what is sleep like. What what classifies it? Exactly. So scientists have been looking at uh, what would be the characteristics of sleep mm -hmm. if you want to jump through those three characteristics. Sure. Uh, so first, it's rapidly reversible. Uh, so uh, you can come out of it quickly, unlike a coma or a seizure or something. Yeah. Uh, next is the uh, reduced arousal. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have less aw awareness of your surroundings and, you know, less uh, Yeah, if someone awake. touches you or makes a sound, you're less likely to get awake than, than in an awake than state. Than when you're awake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to um, and lastly, it maintains homeostasis. You know, if you don't get enough sleep, you'll have to compensate for it later. Yeah, so that's it's a con body's constantly trying to make sure it gets enough of this. So that's that's what the we, uh, three major characteristics are of sleep, um, and then it does have you know scientists have looked at EEG recordings. They have looked at also EMG recordings at muscle um, muscle signals, but looking at the at the brain waves, mm -hmm. they can see that uh, there's a characteristic of non-REM and REM, so uh, rapid eye movements, what uh, REM stands for, and so there's very particular uh, brainwave activities that break down when sleep occurs, mm -hmm. and and it's an oscillation, it's a basically a cycle of moving between non-REM and REM sleep that mm -hmm. happens uh, in, in sleep cycles throughout all, all animals again. Um, yeah, let's keep, let's keep moving on. I thought this part over here is kind of interesting, is that how does... Um, you know, what kind of wakes up the body and what doesn't wake up the body? How does the body know to fall asleep? Um, there are different cues. And those cues can be either be internal or, or external. external. Yeah, so what would be an ex example of an external cue? Um, like, uh, like a person or something, uh, sounds. Yeah, sound or someone touching you yeah, would like, be a cue. Uh, and that would come up through your sensory nervous mm -hmm. system, come up through your through your thalamus and basically wake up, wake up uh, your uh, neurons, start firing, and there are specific pathways for that. Mm -hmm. And then there are internal cues, um, and we're going to talk about some of the internal cues. But there's certain particular internal cues. Some are coming through through your circadian uh, circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. and there seems to be another like internal mechanism of just having the sleep come on. And that's a different type of cue. And uh, would light also be an external cue? Yeah, I think it, it isn't. It's, it's an external cue, and it doesn't go through the same pathway as someone touching you. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, it seems to be linked to the circadian circadian rhythm cue. Um, let's let's talk about that. There's so there's really two process. What we call process C mm -hmm. uh, and process here. Let me just fix that. I want to just change something here. Process C and process S. Uh, so let's talk about process uh, um, S first. So let's let's go with that. Um, you want me to go ahead with that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So basically, 
it looks like um, there's something that happens uh, with a type, there appears to be some type of molecule that gradually builds up when we're awake. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes you sleepy. And then this molecule also decreases when you're asleep. It, we don't exactly know what the mole molecular mechanism is. We don't really know. We think it could be adenosine, adenosine, but uh, we're not 100% sure. But it's called process S, um, I guess for, for process sleep, sleep you know, something like that. But uh, that's it's kind of interesting. Let me just make this a little better here. And then the next one's called process C. Do you want to just talk about that? Sure. Here we so are. process C is a uh, C for circadian, I guess. Yeah. And it's your 24-hour uh, circadian clock, so it's like a, a wave, basically. Mm -hmm. It's controlled by the uh, SCN, or the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is located in the hypothalamus. And that's kind of yeah. like the master clock of the body. Exactly. So it also controls all of the peripher peripheral clocks. Yes. In uh, Which are like the rest of the body clocks and tissues and stuff. Yeah. The, and this is kind of, I kind of put this specifically here, kind of, this is this, this is the sun here, this is meant to be the sun. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is where uh, light coming in from, through your retina over here, and, you know, goes through your octo, octo, uh, optic retino nerve. Retinohypothalamic. Yeah, retinohypothalamic tract. Yeah. Um, and then that goes to suprachiasmatic super nucleus. Which is in the hypothalamus. Which is in the hypothalamus. So there, there you go. So I think this circadian clock is highly influenced by the light mm -hmm. uh, pathway. And um, so let's move on. This little part over here, I want to talk about peripheral clocks. Uh, I know you did. You did mention that they're being controlled by the master clock, but they also they can also be entrained by different methods as well as hormones. Hormones do impact these peripheral clocks. Temperature. So for example, this idea of you know uh, using these cold beds is going to have an impact on on how your body falls asleep mm -hmm. and also eating so if you eat late or um, that's going to change the circadian clock of certain types of uh, uh, organs of your digestive tract mm -hmm. so this is why these things are really important normally they all again influenced by the big master circadian clock but they have their own internal clocks as well Let's move and on. Had a, yeah. A graph here. Yeah. Let's show the graph here. Over here. Yeah. This is really uh, important here. Yeah. Show. The so he, exactly. So we have here's process C. You can see this happening with process C. That's what we were just talking about. The circadian clock, and that's always. And then this is process S. So when is when, you can see that the person is awake here. This is the awake period. And you, this part of the person is awake, and this process S is building up. So as soon as they fall asleep, that uh, that molecule is decreasing, and you can see they're asleep in this time. And then again, this thing Once happens they wake again. Up a bit, uh, yeah, if if there's a this person, if the person stays up a bit longer than than uh, than uh, than previously, then this you can see the pr uh, process as the amount will increase, and then the body will try to compensate by having a longer amount of sleep here as compared to here. So this just shows how these two processes interact. And this what we call the sleep pressure. There's a pressure between the awake and the sleep that's constantly trying to balance. And there are different uh, molecules that influence um, the arousal and the somnolence pathways of the body. And so let's just talk a little bit about that because that's where we come into with this uh, you know, potential medication. Um, Let's just talk first. Generally, most sleeping pills fall by uh, fall into the category of stimulating these GABAergic neurons. Yeah, and GABA is uh, an, inhi an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So exactly. So like something like yeah, all the benzodiazepines or we call the Z Z class medications all stimulate GABA. And the problem with these these types of uh, sleeping medications is that they can uh, they don't have very good efficacy for long-term use so you know most studies show that after three months they don't have the same efficacy the problem is there is dependence so basically they stop working after a few months and uh, and we're not 100 percent sure they actually improve the quality of sleep either so this is 
this is those types of um, Medication? medications. They target those yeah. neurons. But this new medic, this new class of medication, is called an orexin antagonist. It means it it basically will decrease the amount of orexin. And orexin is one of those uh, arousal molecules found in the lateral hypoth hypothalamus. It's released from neurons uh, in that area. Um, and so that's what's pretty exciting about this class of medication is that it seems to just work on this pathway. And it's the first medication that's worked on, on this pathway at all. So it's, it's quite unique. And they did a study looking at about uh, patients using it for 12 months, and they found that there was no dependence. So patients did not get uh, dependent, and it kept working even after one year of using it, which is really great news. Um, I did want to quickly just talk about adenosine. So uh, adenosine is another one of those molecules that we think is responsible for protein, uh, process S. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just basically builds up as you uh, are awake. Yeah. And are you familiar with the effect of caffeine on adenosine? No. <laughs> yeah. So this, how does ca how does coffee keep us awake? Uh, well, coffee's a stimulant. Caffeine's yeah. a stimulant. It basically will decrease adenosine. Mm -hmm. So then that's how people are able to stay awake. So this is how we think um, caffeine works on, on keeping you awake. The other thing uh, is to look at how does uh, sleep impact obesity? And like I did mention to you is that obviously um, when you're eating, that changes the circadian rhythms of certain tissues in your body. But it also um, will increase um, leptin, which increases hunger. Mm -hmm. And ghrelin is the satiety, satiety. Yeah, yeah. molecule. So it does change these molecules around. So uh, people who are not sleeping properly do gain, do gain weight because they're eating more. Mm -hmm. They're just feeling more hungry. So if you want to lose weight, one of the biggest things you can do is making sure you uh, sleep early, you sleep a good amount of time, and uh, you don't eat late. You know, that's, that's definitely quite important. We can talk about that at some uh, future time. I think that might be it for today. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that uh, that was helpful for people. And do send us any questions in the comments. And if you like this, then please subscribe to the channel. Uh, anything else you want to say? I think that's it. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a great Sunday. Take care, everyone. Bye.